Hello everyone, I'm Frank Arlia, and I've known Dick Zimmerman for a few years now, and, I, and today I have the privilege of interviewing him in, rela <laughs> in relation to his, uh, his work with, uh, with Michael Jackson in uh, the release of Thriller. And uh, this is an honor for me. 35 and years, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> It's, it's, it's an honor for me to be uh, uh, doing this interview, and I'm looking forward to finding out a lot more about uh, Dick's adventures with, uh, with Michael. Without further ado, let's get started. So tell me, how did Thriller come about? Well, uh, okay, that's, that's a pretty interesting uh, scenario. Basically, uh, there was a manager, or still is, um, Freddie DeMann. Now, Freddie was one of the top uh, managers. He managed Madonna. And uh, I had uh, done a series of celebrities for Freddie uh, previous to the thriller. And he called me in one day, and he said, I have a project I wanted to talk to you about. I went in, and, uh, and it was funny that Madonna was actually in there when I was there the uh, seeing him that day, and he introduced me, and whatever, whatever, you know, it was, it was fine, and uh, he said, down the road, you know, maybe we should, we'll talk, we'll do Madonna. Anyway, um, so he said uh, that uh, you're here because I, I would like you, or you're in the running, he basically said, uh, to do Michael, Michael Jackson's new album. There was no title for it at that particular time. Uh, he said, but I must be honest with you, there's four other photographers uh, in the running uh, for it, uh, and, and, and you're the fifth. So I said, well, that's, that's totally fine. I, you know, I'm doing well. I, didn't, I wasn't really that ecstatic about it. It didn't matter to me. I, uh, I, I would like to do it, but, you know, whatever. This is right after he did Off the Wall. Uh, which was a, it was a hit, but he wasn't a uh, superstar, you know, he was, he was star, you know. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, I showed Freddie my work. He wanted to see some, some new photographs I did, and he was very happy, thank you very much. Shook my hand, and, and, and we'll see you later, so I left. Um, so about, uh, I guess it was about a week later, I got a phone call from uh, Freddie saying that it's now come down to Michael uh, wants to make the decision on who, who he wants uh, to do his album. We planned it, I think it was about three days later, and uh, I, you know, I, I knew what time he was supposed to be there, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning, and. Uh, I went down, I wanted to meet him, uh, and there was a little knock, knock at the door, a light knock at the door. I opened the door, and there was Michael, and he was alone, and that, that was really interesting in itself, and uh, so we shook hands, and I said, come on, let's go up to my office, which was, I had a loft, a uh, spiral staircase going up to my loft, and we went up there, and uh, he asked to see some of my work, and of course I had it ready, and and I showed him uh, any particular uh, images that you know, and he said no, he wants to see you know an array of, of of pieces, and I went over and I showed him album covers, I showed him celebrities, I showed him uh, photographs of uh, of my work uh, in London because uh, I had a very high fashion portfolio in London, and he loved those. And, uh, and then uh, after that, uh, we just basically talked uh, about uh, life, you know. And, That's uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I asked him, like, what was, you know, on his mind, what was very important to him, and he said the future generation. And we kind of hit it off at that point uh, because I, uh, I had a lot of considerations on the younger generation and, and what's going on right now. And, uh, and I guess we, we met for about three hours uh, at that point, and we just kept talking. It was, it was really a fun time, and uh, we got to know each other pretty well. And, uh, th and that was it. What was Michael's biggest concern about the future, the future generation? 
He was concerned uh, with a few things. He was concerned with uh, children and drugs. Okay. Uh, that, was, that was one of his main things. He was concerned with violence. He was concerned with gun control. Michael was, was like a pure butterfly. He was, he was very, very uh, concerned with the future of this planet. He didn't like violence. Um, well, you got that from his music, you know. Yeah. Some of his, some of his songs were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was very misunderstood. He was a, really a sweet, he was a, a sweet child who, and, and I'm sure the public knows that he never really had a childhood. Um, and he was still like, uh, like a child himself. Uh, just in the way he held himself, the way he spoke, um, he, he was very gentle, and uh, and and uh, and basically that was the tender side of 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 how I saw him, and I think that's why we got on really well, uh, because I. Uh, <laughs> I'm tender as well. well <laughs> no, I, I felt, you know, similar to I'm concerned with the future generation of this planet. And, and, uh, and that's, that's uh, how we really understood each other. How did the concept come about? Huh. Well, that's a story, by the way. And if you know anything about, if you spent any time in Los Angeles, uh, dealing with the bureaucracy of, uh, of record labels, advertising agencies, uh, you'll find that um, <laughs> you waste a lot of time. And uh, basically, uh, when I found out that I was the one who was going to do this uh, album uh, for Michael, uh, I was called up to Epic Rec Records, and um, and they wanted to talk concept with me. Okay, so again, the bureaucracy and the exaggeration is that you know you sit around the table with three or four executives, art directors or whatever, and we go over ideas, and they go over ideas and more ideas, you know, and uh, and so at the end we came up with five ideas. This was, was five particular ways that I was going to work with Michael, okay? So, so uh, basically we skip ahead now to the, to the shoot, and of course I'm not going to uh, go into the beginning of the shoot now, but just basically to answer your question. Um, I went over the concepts with Michael after he arrived, and, uh, and Michael looked at me and said, you know, what, what, what are we going to do that stuff for? And I said, you know, look, this is the business, you know the business. I said, I'm, I'm with you. He said, let's just forget about it, you know. <laughs> and I went into total agreement with him, and, uh, and we said, hey, let's just spend a day having some fun, and we'll play around, and, I'll, and we'll shoot pictures, and, and we'll wing it. And, uh, and that's the way we did it, you know, and we just totally threw away the, uh, uh, the, the, all these, the five concepts, the, all these concepts <laughs> that, that these guys wasted my time with. And by the way, I spent two meetings on these concepts. How did the final wardrobe get selected? Whenever I do a photo shoot, or most photographers do photo shoots for celebrities, they bring in wardrobe. And, uh, and the stylist, which is the one that's responsible for the, for the wardrobe, she brought in, in Michael's case, two big racks of, uh, of, of clothing, uh, all, all kinds. And, uh, and Michael looked through them, you know, and evidently, you know, uh, you can get some idea now as time goes by, you get some idea of the, how particular he was on his innovations. In, in creating his, his wardrobe. So basically, there was nothing on the two racks uh, that he liked. No, and, two uh, racks, he found nothing he liked. No, he didn't find anything on those racks that he liked. And, wow. uh, 
And we didn't have time. I was panicking at that point a little bit because I wanted to get enough time in to spend with him. And, uh, and I didn't really want the, uh, the stylist to go out and get more wardrobe. We didn't have the time. Uh, so I didn't know really what to do. At that point of panic, Michael said to me, um, do you have anything like that? And he was pointing to my, the white suit. Now I wore, I used to wear white most of the time on, on these shoots. And that particular day I was wearing my white suit. And I said, no, I, I don't have it, uh, anything like this. I said, but you know, you and I are just about the same height. We're like six one. Uh, and we were, we were just like, very, very uh, similar. In I, I, I didn't even realize Michael was that tall. Yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe a lot of people don't, but he was, he was tall. Uh, he was 6'1". And uh, so I said, look, you, you can wear my white suit. And he went, really? Oh, that was, uh, that was nice of you. I said, well, look, you like it, and I think it'll look good on you, and, and let's go that route. So... Uh, you know, I gave him my suit. I changed. Uh, we changed in uh, in the uh, dressing room, and I wore one of the items on the rack. On the uh, rack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the famous, the famous rack without anything <laughs> for Michael to wear. <laughs> Whatever happened to the suit? I took my suit back at the end of the shoot, and uh, and believe it or not, uh, for at least two months after the uh, album had come out, I was still wearing my white suit. Okay. <laughs> Be, and, and, and basically, you know, I, I didn't think of it as, as, as anything iconic at that point. The album wasn't iconic at that point. It was doing well, you know. And, and then when it started to do well, I said, you know, um, maybe I better do something with the suit. So I decided to mount it in a plexiglass box. And, uh, and I hung it on my wall and, uh, in my home. And then uh, maybe another month had passed, two months or whatever it was, um, I got a little worried about the value of this particular suit because I used to go out of town a lot and I had a lot of ways to break into my home and I didn't want to leave my wife alone because uh, the suit was obviously going up in value. Uh, and, uh, and then just shortly after that, I received a phone call from uh, Sotheby's auction house. And, um, and they wanted to know whether I'd be interested in auctioning off the suit. And, and I said, yeah, yeah, I probably would because of safety factors, you know. Um, and so we did, uh, we, we auctioned it off. And uh, what was funny about that was that, uh, and, and, and another little story about Michael, of course, Michael, uh, as, as he, very polite as he was, he wanted that suit. And, uh, and maybe uh, the estate wanted the suit, or who knows who wanted the suit. But, but basically, uh, uh, Michael hired his attorney to contact Sotheby's, and Sotheby's contacted me. And, uh, and it was a way for Michael actually b bought the suit from me, and of course I didn't know that. And he wanted it for, uh, uh, for his display. Uh, and it's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame display in Cleveland. And oh, believe, wow, very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but that's how that uh, all came about. So, so, so when, you see, when you see the white suit there, you'll know. <laughs> uh, that's that, that was, was your suit. Sh that was originally your suit. That was my suit. Yeah. And I, you know what? That's an interesting story because it shows that uh, Michael actually wanted to, you know, be fair with you, you know, and uh, and have it uh, auctioned off, but knowing that he was going to be the highest bidder to buy it back. Yeah, that was his way of uh, being polite. How long was this session? I remember Michael arrived at about ten a.m. And, uh, and we didn't really get down to it right away. Uh, we went back up to my loft and we basically talked a little bit. I wanted him to feel a little more comfortable. So we probably spent a good hour before he even started doing any makeup. So this is very rare and exclusive video photographed by me uh, while Michael was getting his makeup done, uh, which was about an hour after he arrived at the studio. Like okay, so here we are inside my makeup 
uh, studio, and uh, that's Karen Faye, my makeup artist, and uh, I'm basically uh, instructing her and also uh, talking to Michael about how I see, how I'd like to see his makeup and hair. I'll just put, I have vitamin E. Excuse me, Mike. I'll probably just use that, sorry. And that guy back there is a, a publicist of his. And my kitchen uh, is behind here. Sure. I'm in the process of making all the stalls, okay? So we're definitely not going to do that. Definitely. Okay. Tell Fred to tell uh, Ron. Yeah. What I want to do, Karen, is I want to get his hair. We're going to wet him slightly. And that's my voice from 1982. So I want to get like, um, like a glistening quality to it, you know, where we can keep like, like small drops of water, like clean. You know what I mean? This is what he used. Do you use this before you use the curlac there? It's water. It's just water. Oil I got pins it. in there to keep my hair down. Hair pins. Oh yeah. Because my hair is just is it wild? wild? Yeah. I want to keep it where it is now, unless there's a certain other look you want to use. Well, no, I like to. I like to. I like to see people. He was very obliging. All right. If, if Don't play with the some, ends, you know. Put, put some water in it. Put some curl at the end yeah. or water and play with the ends, you know. I got like pins. But he had a definite yeah. idea of how he wanted it too. Well, well, I was concerned with my right new Negro. <laughs> <laughs> Keep one back here too. Yeah, there's one. Is it? Uh huh. It's probably been in there for years, right? No, for years. <laughs> I said something funny, something about afro hair. That was the time, you know. I better play start. Right? If it gets like yeah. afro, no, it'll go out like What afro. do you want? You don't want? Well, I thought maybe that could be covered a little bit. Yeah. It looks better when it I keep it down. When I keep my hair down low, it looks yeah. better. Because it could be blended in. He's thinking, he's thinking, he's looking very inquisitive, wondering what I'm going to say. You like this? No, no, no. Oh, down over it? Just over a little bit. Just puff it out a little bit. He had a definite idea of how he wanted his hair. Can I put a little water on it? Is it just water? Is it just water on it? Mm-hmm. Is it going to curl up a little bit with what, just water on it? Mm-hmm. You want me to get it like... That's... Okay, that's just, fine. Just a little bit softer. And then, Dick, you want this a little bit? He looks a little concerned. You want this back? I just want to get like a little over here. But I want to change it back. I think it's going to look untidy. But he's thinking and he really wants to do it himself, yeah, wants to make some changes. I think it would. There I am with my camera. Yeah, let me check it out. Let's see if this, this company has a little bit of color. I hate it. Something he doesn't like. Yeah. See, like if you, when, you, when you push down, we get a few more of those curls. Not a lot, but just a... I like the curls. A few of those sporadically falling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wanted more curls. Okay, I can, I can go in the bathroom. You want to play with it yourself? So there he goes to do it himself. Okay. And, uh, and by the time he finished his makeup, uh, he felt very comfortable in front of me and uh, I could see the difference, you know. So then we basically uh, started to wing it and I came up with this idea and that idea and, and, uh, and, of, and of course we, we made sure that we used the uh, tiger cubs uh, and, and, um, and the lighting, you know, I played around with different ways to light him. Uh, I'll tell you one thing uh, that um, that was pretty evident. Um, 
was while I was shooting him, I wanted him to, there was certain shots that I wanted him to look straight into the camera. Uh -huh. uh, and if you, you know, you look at the album cover, you'll see that he was like three quarters. I was there and, and he was kind of like that, you know. And I, I, as, as much as I tried to get him to look straight into the camera, uh, he either pretended he didn't really uh, uh, understand me or he, he just uh, d didn't acknowledge it. And I think he was, again, being polite to, to, not, to tell me basically that he just didn't want to look straight into the camera. And, uh, and then I finally got it. I finally understood that he felt uh, funny about that. And, uh, and I realized after that, and this is way before he did any of his operations on his nose. And, and I figured that at that point, uh, later on, I figured that he had a, a consideration on his nose that he felt maybe that it was too wide because look, he made it really very thin, you know, after, after a few operations. So I, I, I realized that's the reason I couldn't get him to look straight in. I didn't know that he had so much attention on his face. Uh, and obviously you can see after that he did because of all the changes that he made. But this is way before any of that stuff, you know? Sure. Way before. And so, uh, so tell me, uh, now you've worked with him that day and for... A certain period of time it was four hours, five hours. Well, he he arrived at ten, and we uh, shot till about seven. Wow! So it was a very long day. Yeah, it was a long day, but he wasn't in front of the camera that much. Oh, no, understood. Uh, he was. Uh, I don't know. We probably a total amount of time in front of the camera it was not long at all. Maybe three hours, uh, off and on. You know, we took a lot of breaks, and of course, we broke for lunch. We had a, we had a nice lunch. We ordered in from his uh, vegan uh, restaurant uh, from Govinda's, we ordered in a whole bunch of food for him. And uh, so we spent, you know, three hours or so total Together. time. And I guess you can't say uh, that I enjoyed it as much as I did for the other two shoots after that, because listen, we were getting to know each other. Uh, there was a lot of uh, pressure, you know, the. The album, the, the label uh, always adds pressure onto a situation, you know. But uh, after about an hour or so, uh, I think we were having a, a really good time uh, getting to know each other. And we, there were some funny bits <laughs> that we, we, were, we were laughing, actually, every once in a while. I, I did some uh, entertaining to him, and he was, uh, he was very responsive, you know. We had some fun. And then, oh, and, and then, of course... Um, give, well, give me one of those fun moments. I'd like well, to hear one of those fun moments. <laughs> well, uh, you know, one of the moments, you know, was that uh, he had requested uh, baby cubs, baby tiger cubs uh, to have there. And, uh, and he, as much as he wanted the cubs uh, in, he was also kind of a, a little afraid uh, of, of getting scratched. And I, I don't remember exactly what, you know, but he, he did laugh a lot uh, during, uh, during those, uh, those times. And, uh, um, and they were, uh, in, listen, there were a lot of uh, interesting times. And I'll tell you something about how professional uh, this man was, um, because this never happened to me. Um, he, uh, when he arrived at the studio, he... Um, he had like three or four people with him. And this one particular guy, uh, I, you know, I asked him, who, who is that? And he said, oh, he's my, he's my counter. And I said, what is, what is your counter? And he said, he counts <laughs> the frames. And uh, I said, oh, that's interesting. And I still didn't really know what he, what he was talking about. So, but while I was shooting, this guy was standing to the right of me, and he had one of these clickers, these counters, I guess, and every frame that I shot, he would click, click, you know, click, click. And I, I said, well, geez, that's, that's really interesting because I didn't really uh, know what the purpose was, but the purpose was that he was such a professional, I'm talking about Michael, who was of course. so professional, that he wanted to make sure that he received 
every frame, that there was no frames left over. Uh, he wanted to have everyone. He wanted to keep everyone. Wow. So he counted them. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you've never had an experience like that with any other celebrity? No, never. No. Wow, very unique. No, I've had you know, many celebrities that have uh, bought out the shooting. Uh, bought, being bought out means that they bought the copyright, uh, but no one ever actually bought the physical transparencies, which was really unusual, you know. But, uh, but I was Michael, you know. And, uh, and uh, you know, some of the interesting things uh, about the shoot, uh, I guess one in particular mainly was that I had this huge mirror uh, wall-to-wall mirror, and uh, every time we took a break, Michael would, uh, he would go stand in front of the mirror and he would, uh, he would practice his moves, you know, and he would practice his moonwalk. I was the first one to see a, a moonwalk, and I said, well, what is that? Wow, I've never seen anything like that before. No one had, had ever seen the moonwalk as far as I knew before me. I didn't, <laughs> know what he was, I didn't know what he was doing and I thought, oh wow, that's really interesting. And I said, Michael, what is that? He says, that's my moonwalk. <laughs> so I thought, wow, that's interesting. He did some other moves too that he was uh, practicing, but that was to me the most memorable one. I had never seen anything like that, you know. And, uh, and then once the shoot was over, um, how much more time did it take before you know, they went through the whole selection process and they finally picked, you know, the, or they've picked the photo for the album. <laughs> well, you know, that's another story. But basically, uh, about a week later, maybe five days later, I don't remember exactly, um, uh, I, we received a phone call that Michael was ready to look at the photographs. And... Uh, um, I went to, he was recording Thriller at at a studio's, uh, Westlake uh, studio on Beverly Boulevard, right across from CBS Records. Uh, now you know where that is. It's a, <laughs> now it's a, a trademark. Uh, well, if you don't know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it, but, uh, but that's where it was. And I, I, I got there and uh, I brought a light table because back then there was no digital photography. This is all film. And uh, I set up all the photographs uh, for him. And he came out of the studio. He was re recording Thriller uh, at that particular time. And uh, he looked uh, at them and he went, oh my God, I, I can't, how can I, uh, I, can I select? I mean, they're all so good. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know what to do. Um, oh, 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 wait a second. And he turned and he ran into the studio. And it, it, this time I was outside. Uh, in the in the lobby area, you know, and a couple of minutes later, he comes running out with uh, Quincy Jones. I had met Quincy before uh, when uh, Michael uh, interviewed me the first time at Westlake, and uh, he uh, said to Quincy, "Look, look at all these beautiful photographs, and I can't. I need you to help me uh, pick pick one for the album cover, or pick a few for the album cover." Well. Okay, this is absolutely true. Quincy looked at the pictures, he bent over, and in 15 seconds, I've never seen anything like this, he went, there's your cover. That's your cover, Michael. <laughs> and I, I actually thought he was kidding, but that was the cover. That <laughs> is the cover. That will always be the cover. That's the iconic cover, picked out by Quincy Jones in 15 seconds. That very was it. cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you were to come up with a, an analogy of your your of Michael Jackson, you know, the, uh, the artist, the entertainer, and and his impact on the music industry, uh, what would it be? Well, you know, um, I did a interview, uh, and you could probably Google it uh, on uh, YouTube, uh, Dr. Drew show. And uh, it's, it's obviously, it's, it's still there for you to see. Um, it would be good to answer that question by actually you uh, going and watching that interview. And, and it, the reason I, I'm saying that is because um, I uh, defended Michael uh, 
uh, basically the media, um, you know, they all they wanted to do was find uh, ways to uh, suppress and invalidate uh, this genius. And I expected that to happen when I decided to do that live interview on Dr. Drew. So I prepared uh, a, a composition that I was going to read uh, if that happened. And he, he, at the beginning of the interview, he asked me a couple of pertinent questions for the interview, and that was fine. And then he asked me a question that that had to do with uh, children, you know, and child molestation and, uh, and all of that. And I uh, whipped out my paper and I said, well, here's my answer to that. And I defended him on that. And it was really uh, kind of interesting. I got, I got thousands of phone calls uh, after that uh, interview uh, because basically I had headphones on and I was listening to the producer. And the producer was saying, get, what the hell is this guy doing? Get him off the air, you know? Uh, and I just refused. It was a live show. I didn't really care. So I just kept going to defend Michael. And I keep, uh, and the reason I mention it is it's a perfect answer to, to your question, you know? Because I really respected this man. Uh, he was a genius and, and he didn't, he wouldn't hurt anyone. You know, and uh, I got I got to know him, and I and I know that about him. So that I hope that answers that question. Yes, absolutely, it does. Thank you. So let me ask you this question. Yeah. You know, what are your thoughts in comparing Michael Jackson's contributions thirty five years ago to the current music scene today? Hmm. Well, um, I, I first of all, when Michael's Thriller came out. Uh, there was nothing like it. Um, it not only it not only changed uh, the the direction of music, but it also changed, if you remember, the total direction of videos, music videos. Uh, it, it it turned music videos into movies in a way, uh, and it was not a a video that was just three minutes or whatever, you know. It expanded. It totally expanded, and uh, and and again, the music was so different. Uh, the beat was so different, and uh, and I guess it's the you know the collaboration between uh, Quincy Jones and Michael was was unbelievable. Um, it was just uh, something that was never happening before. It just changed changed the industry, uh, and it it changed the industry. Uh, financially as well, because that album um, is still uh, the largest selling album in history. Uh, and, you know, I'm very proud to say that my photograph is the uh, largest distributed photograph in history. Um, it changed, it just changed everything. The direction of that album changed everything. You know, your work is very unique. How do you manage uh, to capture something uh, so lifelike, you know, in your work? And, and give us an example with, uh, with Michael Jackson. Now, now you're talking about my painting now, be, uh, because that's mostly what I'm doing now is, is painting. They used to call me the image maker uh, in Los Angeles for those years. And I had a knack for bringing out the real personalities of, of the celebrities that I used to photograph. And quite often they would tell me that they learned more about themselves and their subtleties than they did in all the years of acting school or sometimes even uh, up on the, on the big screen. They, they, they learned uh, about these little subtleties of what lit up their faces. And, and the reason was that I, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I would never go on automatic uh, when I photographed anyone. I, I made sure that uh, I delved into who they really were. And, I, uh, and every frame that I took, I basically talked to people and I, and I, and I had them 
you know, give me themselves. I, I didn't want to. I, I didn't want the artificial. Uh, um, the, you know, the artificial person, I didn't want it at that at all, that automatic person. Because uh, when they were in front of my camera, uh, I was in charge, you know. Uh, and I wasn't intimidated, but I, I would do whatever it took to get the image that uh, was important to me. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and of course, uh, I, I, a lot of the time, that image was an image that I use as reference uh, for my paintings. So I wanted it to be perfect. And, and actually, uh, people don't really know that one of the reasons I went into photography was basically to make my paintings better. Uh, because I, I would uh, learn more about lighting uh, that applied more to my paintings, and, and I wanted to get uh, the exact image, the exact uh, uh, personality uh, coming out, uh, that was very important to me. When you were taking pictures of Michael Jackson, yeah. what major elements were you working to achieve in your shots? Well, it was just basically, it's an extension of what I was just telling you. Um, I wanted to uh, bring out the subtleties of who he was. Now, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something interesting um, uh, about, about the shoot. The, you have to understand that uh, after the album came out, this is before they even had a title for it, uh, Michael and I were just playing around and we were shooting pretty pictures. That's really all. There was no concept. We avoided the concept, as we, as right. we talked about before. So. When it was all said and done, uh, they decided that the name is Thriller, okay? And they also decided to do the first video is Ghouls in a Graveyard, you know? Where it's actually never really related to, to the album cover. Uh, there's no relationship to the album cover at all. And, um, and so uh, it was a just a pretty picture, you know. Um, but as uh, time went on, I decided uh, to do um, another painting. I decided every five years I was going to do another painting of the Thriller cover. And this particular one uh, is the first one, and you can see that I've uh, painted it which relates a little more to Thriller. You know, I painted a spider on his shoulder and, uh, and the eyes sort of in the background. You don't really know what that is, you know. And uh, so to me, it, it, it's probably a better album cover uh, than the original one. Uh, but it's kind of interesting, the story, the iconic story and that album cover. That you wonder why that they pushed, pushed it in that direction. I always wondered why they pushed it in. Uh, in that direction, but I guess one of the songs, of course, that Michael had was was Thriller, you know. So anyway, in five years from now, uh, I'm going to do another one, and uh, who knows where it's going? It uh, it might be a total <laughs> a painting in the graveyard, or or who knows what, or abstract, or wherever it might go. I, I don't really know. And this will give you some idea of um, of of what he was like. And uh, I used to, uh, there was this restaurant uh, on Third Avenue in Los Angeles. It was, the name of it was uh, Govinda's. And, uh, and Michael used to eat there quite, quite often. And there was one time I saw him before the thriller and he was, uh, I, he was online and uh, he didn't know me, I didn't know him. And, uh, but I remembered that time. Now about uh, two months after the Thriller came out. Uh, my wife and I went to eat there, and uh, and I and you know it wasn't a point where the the Thriller album had had really shot to the top. It was you know doing really well, and there was Michael on, online, and and so um, you know we went in the restaurant. I didn't actually. I, I kind of waved to Michael at that point, and uh, he got, waved back and. And we went into the restaurant, and he went all the way in the back of the restaurant. And my wife and I went to the other side of the restaurant. And uh, 
Anyway, so uh, time passed and we're, uh, we're eating and all of a sudden there's like a little tap on my shoulder, light, a very light tap. And I look up and it's Michael. And uh, he says, and, and, and basically what he did, instead of being cool and walking out of the restaurant, you know, like LA people do and they kind of give you a little wave if they're going to be that generous. He walked over to our table and, uh, and it was quite a distance and he went out of his way to thank me for my participation in, in the Thriller album. That was very polite of Michael. I mean, he really, he gave me a hug and from a tap went to a hug and it was, uh, it was really a nice uh, th uh, thing for him to do at that point. Uh, and uh, it gives you some idea of how sensitive uh, uh, he, he really was. And uh, that, it meant a lot. It meant a lot to me. Yeah. It really did. It was a, it was a, see that. It was a nice a validation to, to, to my uh, uh, contribution to the album. What were you trying to communicate with the Thriller album cover? But actually, <laughs> you weren't trying to communicate anything because, you know, that was the picture that they, that they took. I mean, and that they chose, or Quincy chose, right in front of, uh, you know, in 15 seconds, as you, as you explained earlier. So here's the famous cover, okay? And uh, basically, th this is the subtleties, of course, uh, uh, that I wanted to go over. If you... If you look at Michael's face carefully and you realize that uh, I'm in front of him, uh, you'll see that his, his attention really is not on me. And, and where his attention was, was over here uh, on the tiger cub, which was on his knee. And of course, that was what they did on the inside of the cover. So. This is just another take of, of that. So the, the cub is still there on his knee, but, uh, but he's a little bit concerned right. that the cub would maybe crawl up his arm or something and scratch his face, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, what does the back cover look like? Well, the back cover is nothing. The back cover is, is this text, and I'll tell you, I'm glad my credit is not on the bottom here because this is impossible to read uh, here. But, you know, uh, obviously what, what uh, really helped my career was this little tiny credit on the inside uh, of photography of Dick Zimmerman. But I got to tell you something, as small as that was, and I, I did really well, I was doing really well at that time in my career. But let me tell you, this, this uh, launched me to the top, that little credit there. After this uh, album hit, hit the, uh, the charts, uh, my phone never stopped ringing. When the album really went big, uh, I took out a, a full-page ad in Variety magazine, and, uh, and I duplicated uh, the album cover. Well, actually, what I duplicated was uh, the, the inside here uh, was the Variety ad, and uh, instead of uh, the tiger cub on my knee, I put the camera, the Hasselblad camera. Hasselblad is a, is a two and a quarter by two and a quarter uh, transparency size, and I put that on my knee instead of the tiger cub. And also there was a little handkerchief here he had, uh, kind of a yellow handkerchief, and uh, I put a couple of rolls of film, Kodak film, in my pocket. And, uh, uh, and when this ad came out in Variety, it was crazy. I mean, it was just total crazy because nobody actually knew at that time who really uh, shot the album cover, you know. And uh, my phones just went off, off constantly. How many other stories, you know, do you have on working together with Michael? Well, I, I, you know, I worked with him three times. So the second time uh, was not too long after uh, Thriller. Uh, I got a phone call from Steven Spielberg who wanted me to do uh, the E.T. cover, E.T. album, right. Extraterrestrial with, uh, with Michael. He wanted 
Michael to uh, narrate uh, the story. How did you get chosen to, uh, to do the, the, their uh, wedding portraits? Yeah, but that was going to be my next story. Well, thank you everyone for, uh, for participating and being part of this uh, interview. And I want to thank Dick for allowing me the opportunity and the pleasure of, uh, of, of enjoying his stories and his time with Michael Jackson, which was obviously uh, very entertaining. I enjoyed telling about it. Uh, thank you for watching.